Jai Gurudev, Jai Masters. And there is a truth that is so powerful and so deep, and it's right in front of us, but we ignore it completely. I have trouble ignoring it. I'm going to tell you the truth. I look at pictures of the galaxies, and some people say, oh, isn't that pretty? It's not pretty to me. It's like, give me a break. 300 billion stars in one galaxy, and your sun is one of those. And there are two trillion galaxies. Just go out into space with your mind. See the galaxies floating by as you travel at the speed of light, spreading out. And realize that at some point, when you look back, you're lost. You'll never find this place again. How would you ever find the place again? It's not a needle in a haystack. It's one needle out of 300 billion haystacks, of which there are two trillion of them. And you live on a tiny, you don't live on that galaxy, and you don't even live on that one star in the galaxy. You live on a tiny piece of dirt spinning around one of those stars. Please, please, I beg you, just while you're in here, will you let go of the absurdity of what you're doing with your life? The absurdity of what you're doing with your mind. It's like, I told you, 1.3 million Earths fit inside the sun. It's the truth. The truth has power. You have an obligation to pay attention to the truth. How do you like that? You do. You have an obligation. Why? Because it's the truth. It's that simple. And so basically, this tiny piece of dirt is spinning around this one star. And I told you, your next nearest star is, I think, 4.3 light years away. It doesn't mean anything to you. Let's make it mean something. If I catch a beam of light, I'm holding it up over my head. There's a beam of light. I caught one little beam. If I hold it over the earth and I let it go for one second, it circumnavigated the globe seven and a half times. Is that pretty fast? Go at that speed for 4.2 years every second. You'll reach the next star. There's 300 billion in your galaxy, and they're all kind of that far apart. Your next galaxy is, I believe, 2.5 million light years away. Imagine 2.5 million light years at the speed per second. That's how long it will take you to get there. You're not getting there ever. You may never get to the next star. But at the speed of light, it will take you 2.5 million years to get to Andromeda galaxy, your next galaxy. There are two trillion of those. And what are you doing with your life? Can we discuss that? This is the truth. We can see it. We have telescopes. Man, the James Webb telescope can see way out there. You remember that deep space photo, the deep field photo? They looked at the, and this, and this was with the Hubble, but they also did it with the James Webb recently. They looked at the darkest spot in space that they ever have seen with any of their telescopes. And they believe there was nothing there because it's dark, okay? And like really good telescopes, both the Hubble and Earth telescopes. This is the darkest spot. There's nothing. They took a long exposure photo. I forget how long it was, days or whatever it was, of that spot and they were stunned. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies in that spot. <laughs> what you see is a star. Every one was a galaxy. If you took a straw, a regular s drinking straw, not one of these big ones, there's a regular old straw, right? Six feet long, and look through it, how much would you see? The longer it is, the less you see. That's what they took a picture of, and there were thousands and thousands of galaxies. Okay, it is the truth. So the question is, 
What's wrong with that? Nothing is true. You want to feel God? People want to feel God? Go there. Not a church or a temple or a synagogue. Go there with your mind because you're, you're in God. It's really not in you. You're not in teachings. You're not in books. You're way past all that, aren't you? All right? That is reality. That is what's created. All right. There's a lot of peace there. What does the Bible say? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's the truth they're talking about. It's bigger than what you're doing with your life, isn't it? So that's reality. And if you go there, what happens to the astronauts? There's this thing called the overview effect. Ever heard that? They fly up there. They're engineers. They're Air Force people, military people, and the, you know the original astronauts and stuff. They fly up there, and they get off the Earth, and they see this little ball, blue beautiful ball floating through outer space. Every one of them comes back a different person. They studied this. Psychologists studied it. NASA studied it. It's called the overview effect. Because you got out of your little space, how small is your space? Let's talk about this. I already told you that 1.3 million Earths fit inside the sun. How small is your space on the Earth? Generally, six feet by three feet, give a few inches. There. That's the space you take up on this thing that 1.3 million fit inside the sun, and that's one out of 300 billion. You're not taking up much space, are you? How much of your life is about your little space? 100%. Maybe we knocked it down to 99.999 because we had this discussion today. All right? Otherwise, it is about me. You want to know ego? Ego is not this egotistical, boisterous, megalomaniac. No, 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 no. That's just an extreme, messed up ego. Ego means I am thinking about me. What else am I going to think about? How about the rest? <laughs> Your mind just thought about the rest. I made you do it. Plus, it, it really wouldn't go out there, would it? It would go to a certain point and it would break. No, you can get it out there. You can. Get, I dare you. I dare you. All right, meditation or some time. Just get off the stupid planet. The way I trained myself to do it way back in the early 70s is first I'd sit on top of the planet. It was like my chair. I sit up there, floating through outer space, and I'm on this chair. I look around, and I see the stars and stuff like that, and then I do this bold thing. I throw myself off, like zip lining, except there's no line. I throw myself off the planet, and, and you see her first, and then, go on, do it. Do it. It's a meditation. Float. Float. You're fine. You're fine. There's no gravity out there. Don't worry. You're not going to fall. And float. And then start going faster and make it past the, to the sun, and then past the sun, and past all the planets. And then, like, that's a big deal, our solar system. It is not. Do you understand that? These tiny little balls around one star. Oh, there's 300 billion. I told you how far away the next star is. It's nothing. If the entire thing, y'all are worried about, you know, atomic bombs and stuff, I don't want to tell you this. Nobody else will talk like this, but I will. If the entire Earth blew up, a few of the planets would adjust their orbit and nothing else would make any difference. Nothing. I just told you how far away the next star is. I told you how far away the next galaxy is. It doesn't have any effect on anything. It's nothing. It's a piddly little drop in the nothing. That's what this is. Even your next galaxy at 2.5 million light years, there's no way it's feeling a thing. Galaxies collide with each other all over the place. Supernovas blow up, oh my God, giving off more power. We don't feel it. You don't feel anything. If the thing went away, it means nothing. It's just the truth. You don't like that truth, but you should like that truth. Why? Because it's the truth. And because it takes a real burden off of you. Do you understand that? It's just what's going on. Now, what happens to us, instead of us, let, let me finish, then float out there, and start going faster till all the galaxies are flying past you. You're looking forward. I remember the first time I did it, I was always going forward, floating past the galaxy at the speed of light. Then I turned around. I couldn't find home. <laughs> well, how am I going to find it? Which galaxy? I had two trillion galaxies. <laughs> I know you're one in a million, but how about one or two trillion? And then you got to find the galaxy, and you got to find the star. Not a chance, right? Get comfortable out there. Oh, I've never talked to you like this. Get comfortable not being able to find home and then stay out there long enough to where you forget there was such a thing as home because there isn't. There's just a universe. 
all the time, everywhere, that's all there is in the universe, and then just float out there. And what you're going to do, you will start to, forget the overview effect the astronaut feels, you will start to feel your consciousness being freed from your mind. Because there's no reason for your mind to be thinking about anything. You hear me? You don't have a husband and wife of this and that, and children, thing and body, and thing old and young, and thing and the pain. There's, there's nothing. You're just out there. Okay? And what will happen is the consciousness will let go of all that. And it's not addicted to that anymore. And you're going to find out that your consciousness is who you are. You're still there, conscious. But you don't have all this stuff. It's called liberation, freedom, real freedom. But stuff, the stuff, you know, the stuff you carry around every moment of your life, don't you? What do I look like? What did I say? Oh my God, what happened 10 years ago? And why did she do that to me? I wonder if she still likes me. Oh my God, should I say something? Is this me? Never had stuff like that? You're carrying around all this weight, all this stuff. And you wonder why you're not okay. How can you be okay? You won't be okay. Go out there. I beg you, just do it a couple of times a day. It doesn't take any time at all. And then float out there and, and imagine that's where you are. And it's the truth. And you don't have all this stuff. You have all this stuff. And what's going to happen is you'll experience yourself as consciousness, not as the thoughts, not as the body, not as this stuff. You're just the consciousness that's aware that you're there. And then it will happen. It's happened to great masters you will feel it start to get pulled up, up. And now you can get close to God. You get close to what created all of this. Why is this all here? You're capable of reaching the highest states that could possibly be. Yoga has, has Master Yoga and I used to talk about two states of samadhi. What's samadhi? That, okay? That you, you completely, consciousness released itself from the body, from the thoughts, from the emotions. Those are just things you're paying attention to, aren't they? You do pay attention to your mind, don't you? You pay attention to your emotions. What if you didn't? What if you weren't pulled down into your mind? What if you weren't pulled down into your thoughts? What if you weren't pulled down into your emotions? You are pulled down, aren't you? You don't have to be. Deep meditation, you're not. And in the state I just told you, you're not. You're free. You're free of yourself. It's not freedom to do what you want. It's not freedom for yourself. It's freedom from yourself. Would you like to spend a moment being completely free and not having all this stuff pulling you down into it? All right? So I gave you an experiment you can play with. It's a nice meditation. Go out there. And as I sort of tell you, you're going to talk about great yogis, talk about two different states of what they call samadhi. What's samadhi? Where the consciousness has freed itself from being distracted by the body, by the mind, and by the emotions. So you pull back into consciousness itself. And he called it Sabhikalpa Samadhi and Nirbhikalpa Samadhi. I never talk about these things. I don't ever want to talk about these things. I, don't, I want you to go there. I don't want you to, I don't want you to know about them. Sabhikalpa Samadhi is the state where you're out. You're completely out. And you can see the universe. There's still form. But your consciousness is not so distracted by you, not distracted by you at all, to where you're able to see the rest. Why can't you see the rest? If you stare at a picture so much... You don't see anything else. Just stare at one thing. There's nothing else in the universe. What if you stared at nothing but that year after year all the time? That's what you know. There's nothing else you know. Psychology says you're the sum of your learned experiences. That's your learned experience. There's no other learned experience. That's your universe. Now if somebody comes along and says, hey, hello, hits you on the head. You hardly feel it because you're busy staring. And Yoda's doing, okay, so he taps you on the toe. He's not tall enough for your head. And he just sits there and says, Hey, wake up. Stop staring at her. Stop staring at the picture. Stop staring at that one knot in the wall. How? I, no, what are you talking about? That's who I am. I'm the one who stares at the knot. No, you're not the one who stares at the knot. Well, you're much bigger than that, okay? It's just that you're staring at it. And then he teaches you ways to not stare at it. You meditate. You, you go through all kinds of mantras and all kinds of stuff, right, to get yourself not to stare at the knot. And what's going to happen? At some point, it's going to go, oh, whoa, where did you come from? I'm serious. Whoa. Wow. I don't know. You were there. That's Sabi Kalva Samadhi. You stopped staring at yourself. Not staring at the knot. Staring at your thoughts, your emotions, your body, what you see through your senses. You are staring at that, aren't you? Guess what? Just like you don't need to stare at the knot, you do not need to stare at that. That is something you're doing. You're staring at it. What if you didn't? Whoa. And all of a sudden, the whole universe becomes available to you. Not 
your house and somebody else. I took my mind off myself. I'm paying attention to her. We're not talking about that. We're not bigger than that. When you stop staring at this, your consciousness is aware of all of it. Master Yogananda said when he enters his first time, Sabikalpa, he felt his body was the universe. All the galaxies were inside of him. He was spreading out the speed of light on all the edges, and that's what he was. That's who you are. That's what you are. You do not have to stare at that knot in the wall, at your thoughts, and so on. Then the next state is near Bikalpa Samadhi. I can't talk about it without crying. What's near Bikalpa? Formless. That's your free with form. You're still in form. <laughs> it's got a big form, all right? When you go into Nirvikalpa, when the Master is going to Nirvikalpa, there's just the void. That's what the Buddha talked about, the void. Talk about non-duality, that your consciousness now is only aware of being conscious. It's not aware of an object of consciousness, such as your thoughts or the galaxies. You're still the consciousness that's aware of that stuff. All right? Why can't consciousness just be centered in consciousness itself? And that's, your, that's God. That's the unmanifest before creation was created. It's still there. So these are very, very deep yogi states. The great masters, uh, Krishna, different ones, went into these states. And they stayed there for days. Yogis, great yogis, the great masters went into those states. All right? And Mayor Baba was so deep that when he went to sleep, he had to have a disciple stand outside his doorway. It's a true story. Stand outside his doorway and look in periodically and make sure he was wiggling his big toe because if he didn't, he wouldn't be there in the morning. That's how tenuous his consciousness tied to his body was. When he reached the near state, the total merger, and I don't want to scare you, okay? But I, I should, I, here, here, here's the disclaimer. Don't worry, you won't go there. <laughs> he said it took five years and five perfect masters to bring him back to where he could do his work within the body. Okay? You are a very great being. He is not any different than you. You're the exact same thing. But your consciousness staring at a knot in the wall or consciousness staring at your body, at your thoughts, at your emotions all the time, aren't you? And he wasn't. He wasn't staring at it at all. You know who else wasn't? Christ. My father and I are one. Okay? That, I mean, God's the size of a body? No, he's the size of God. The consciousness is not staring at this. It's liberated. That's liberation. These are great words, but I never talk to at this level, and nor will anybody else. But you should understand. All right? It's called jivan mukta, a liberated soul. You're free. You're out. You can come back. Somebody once asked Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba was an avatar. Mayor Baba was a very, very great, great being. Yogis could come in, in different flavors, different heights. Most people who say they're yogis aren't. They're not that kind of yogi. All right. Most people say they're enlightened. They had a nice experience. And so you have an experience. That's wonderful. Guess what? This is how you tell people. I had this amazing experience. You mean you're not there now? It didn't become the state of your being? No, it was an experience I had. Okay, mazel tov. That is not enlightenment. A truly enlightened being doesn't come back. I told you that the other day. It really blows my mind. I got, I'm not a Bible studier. I read the Bible once in 1971 or 72. But different things just, when I talk, they come back, all right? There is a line in the Bible, I think it was John the Baptist who said it, when he was baptizing. And he said, To him to whom you see the dove descend and remaineth there, to him is given the power to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That is so yoga. That is so yoga. That is so, that's just unbelievable. What do you mean the dove? Shakti, the spirit, the consciousness, the, the force of creation. That's what they mean by spirit. But it didn't say come and have an experience. The line I love and remaineth there. Wow. It means it's not an experience you had, it's a state you're living in. When Yogananda came to America back in 1920 with a turban on his head, hardly spoke English, he said, Christ belongs to the yogi. Whoa. You want to know what? Christ belongs to the yogi. That's what yoga is about, the merger state. My father and I are one. And so basically, when the Shakti, when the divine consciousness, which is what you are, 
is no longer being distracted strictly by yourself. It's able to feel itself as itself. And it feels all this power, all this shakti, all this spirit, call it whatever you want. All right? It's yoga. So, so first of all, I want to get this straight. It's you. We're not talking about somebody else. Are you conscious? Are you conscious? How do you know? There's no answer to that, right? Are you in there? How would we do it that way? Are you in there? You sure? You sure you're in there? You're conscious because you're conscious of your thoughts. You're conscious of your emotions. You're conscious of what you see through your eyes. If you're not conscious, you're not there. You are conscious, aren't you? Were you conscious when you were little? See? That's who you are. Did your body look like it looks now when you were little? But you were looking, weren't you? Have you been in it the whole time? You sure? Wake up. You're a great being that is staring at something not so great. How's that? It's called a human. You are not only human. You are consciousness, divine consciousness, awareness, staring at a knot in the wall. That's basically what we are. <laughs> okay? So so basically, there are these great, great states. Those are truths. I'm a truth today, aren't we? Okay? And you can go into these states. You are these states. Not, no, by the way, I don't want you to go into them. I want you to stop not being in them. That's what I've been teaching you lately. You don't go to God. You don't go to God. You stop leaving. Do you understand the difference? I'm sitting in this chair, staring at that knot, and the guru wakes me up, right? I don't come back to the chair. I never left, did I? I never left the chair. I'm sitting in the chair, staring at the knot, but I stared so much that I identified my entire life as that knot. Then I can't say, go back to the chair. Stop leaving the chair. You're leaving it with your mind. You're leaving it with your consciousness. So you say, go back to God. No, stop leaving. You're there already. I, I, oh, that's a nice thing I like to tell you. You're the highest being of all face of the earth. Okay? Again, did Christ say, what I am you can't be? No, he didn't say that. He says, as I sit by the throne of my Father, that's a state of consciousness. As I sit by the throne of my Father, so you shall sit by my throne. And these things that I do, you should do these and even greater things. And, and by the way, I just use the analogy of me sitting in the chair staring at the knot. Come back to the chair. So if I'm staring there, they ask Christ, well, where's the kingdom? He didn't say in Iraq somewhere. He didn't say after you die. What did he say? The kingdom is within you. What does that mean? What I just told you. You are the consciousness. The kingdom is within you. That's who you are. You're the one who's staring at your thoughts. You're the one who's staring at your emotions, aren't you? You're already there. So now we can have a discussion. We laid the groundwork for truth. All right? Okay. So what's going on here? If I am truly the divine consciousness, which you are, my father and I are one, right? You are the divine consciousness. There's only one consciousness. We did, said it with the Shemite, didn't we? The Lord is one. One, non-dual. There's one. But I see lots of things. Yeah, but you who sees them is one. It's always been you. That's the place you can touch the one you understand. I asked you a question. Weren't you there yesterday? Were you there yesterday? How do you know? Don't answer me. <laughs> you can't answer. You understand that? You intuitively know you were there yesterday, don't you? Were you there last week? Were you there a year ago? Were you there five years ago? You understand that? You have been in there the entire time. But I changed. You did not change. What you looked at is changing. Your body is changing. Your thoughts are changing. Your emotions are changing. The scenery in front of you is changing. You who sees all that stuff, you are not changing. You have never changed. You will never change. You are in there. You, know, you have parents that are older, okay? I'm losing my memory. How do you know? Somebody knows. Who knows? I am. I am losing my memory. I am sad. I am happy. Who's the I am? I am the consciousness, the awareness of being that is aware. I know that I know that I know because I know. I am that I am. What did Moses, what, what did God say to Moses? What's your name? If I have to go down to the Pharaoh, he's a pretty strong guy. They got a lot of gods. What should I tell him what God's sending me? What did he say? I am that I am. I am that I am. 
Everything is telling you the exact same thing. Every tradition, every religion, everything. All the great beings. Okay, so you're in there. You are the consciousness. And that is the divine consciousness. It's very, we all, by the way, that consciousness is watching your thoughts. The consciousness watching your thoughts is the same consciousness. It is just staring at something else. The sun has many rays, doesn't it? That's not just one solid ray. There's many rays. It's the same sun. It's coming from the same place. It's the same thing. But it falls on different objects. So the consciousness, the consciousness is staring at that, 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 and, and the mosquito, that, 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 and the roach, and that, and that. And if it moves, God's in there. So this word universal consciousness, I don't even, I don't like it at all. Expanded consciousness. You're not expanding your consciousness. You're ceasing to contract it. If I'm staring at that knot in the wall, I don't expand my consciousness to see the rest of you. I stop staring at the thing. I stop constricting the stare of my consciousness to my thoughts, my emotions, my body, and what's coming through my eyes. I, me, mine. That's ego. I, me, mine. I'm staring at me. Are you staring at you? You've done it your whole life, haven't you? What do I want? What do I not want? I, 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 I. That is something so great that is staring at your stuff. So now we're going to get down to spiritual growth. First, what does spiritual growth mean? Stop staring at yourself. And you're going to find out that the one that was staring is very, very great. What Muktananda is saying, meditate on the self. <coughs> Honor and worship your own inner being. God dwells within you as you. That's what Christ taught you, as what Buddha taught you, as what every great being has taught you. You are it, but you are staring away from yourself. You are staring down at your thoughts, at your emotions, at your body, and out at the world that comes in through your senses, so you feel individual. If I stare at the knot, that's an individual knot. It says you're staring at one thing. You who's staring are not what you're staring at. You who's looking at it are not what you're looking at. You are the seer. That's called that also, the seer. The one who sees. That's who you are, the one who sees. All right. Now, what do I do about all this? Because I'm having trouble with my life. My son, my son's not doing what I want to do. I didn't get into this college I want to get into. How am I the greatest thing? And I, my finger hurts. Oh, my God, I bent it. And like, I am my body. I am my thoughts. I am my emotions. All right. And then what happens is, that's like the fall from the garden. You fell from the state of great consciousness, divine consciousness, down into your thoughts, into your emotions, into your body, didn't you? And now what happens? Because you can't handle, it's not so pleasant staring at the knot. It's not so pleasant staring at those thoughts, is it? Okay, not so much fun staring at those emotions. It's not all that fun to hang out with his body, getting old, his aches and pains and sicknesses. Okay, now what do you do? I love it. This is the final fall from the garden. So I'm staring at something and I'm not okay. I'm okay, but the thing I'm staring at is not, by the way. You are always okay. I told you once, and I'm in big trouble. No one is depressed. They are staring at a dark part of their being. If they were to stop staring at it, they would be fine. I wish I would tell a story in the Untethered Soul. Somebody's girlfriend leaves them, or boyfriend or girlfriend leaves them, and they're dumped, and they're so depressed, and their heart is aches, and they don't even get out of bed, and they're not cleaning anything up, and they don't shower, and they don't want to talk to anybody, they don't answer the phone, and it's been going on for weeks. They're depressed, period. And the phone rings, and uh, somehow they say, oh, it's a stupid thing, don't leave me alone. And it's the girlfriend. Hello, George? Oh, my God. I am so sorry. I was so stupid. You're the most important thing to me. I never realized how much I love you, but I miss you so much. Uh, please forgive me. Can I come back? How you doing? <laughs> Are you depressed? No energy. Can't do anything. Can't think straight. You're up running around. She's coming over. You're cleaning up, taking a shower. <laughs> Have I told the truth? All right. Then when you say, I am depressed, you just define yourself, the I am, as depression. You're not depressed. You're staring at a depressed part of your psyche. And how I know? Because what it says, I'll never be okay. 
she was the woman of my life, and how did I do? Why did I say that? I'll never be happy again. For there. That's not you talking. That's your mind talking. See, they're called thoughts. Have them? You have thoughts? What if they're dark? Then you stare at dark thoughts, and that's what depression is. You stare at a closed heart. That's what depression is. Wake up to who you are. Do you know why it's nice to know this? Because you can get out. Nothing has ever tainted your being. No sins, no karma. Forget the whole stupid thing. That's stuff you look at. That's stuff you're carrying along with you. You do something terrible and hurt somebody. You feel guilty. Now you get to stare at that, stare at that mess. The moment you let go of your personal self, it means nothing. The great masters teach that the moment of true enlightenment, that awakening, all karmic seeds burn and fall off, will never affect you again. That's why I just told you, isn't it? Why? Because you stop staring at them. Here, carry 10 pounds in each arm, in each hand. Carry them. Walk, walk, carry them. Guess what? The moment you let them go, they don't affect you ever again for the rest of your life. Okay, stop staring at this garbage and it will have no effect on you. If it feels like I'm yelling at you, I am. <laughs> so you're staring down at the thoughts. They bring you down and then the heart brings you down and then the body brings you down. Now, you're a very intelligent person. What do you do about it? You use the very mind that's having trouble. You go to the mind that's saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I'm saying, mind, what should I do? You do. You go to your own mind that's in trouble to say, what do I do about it? Because I'm going to tell you, I know what it's going to say to you every single time. It's going to say, well, when she was being nice to me, I felt better. So the answer is to get her to be nice to me. When I had a nicer house than the neighbor till they built a nicer one than me, I felt pride. I was happy to bring people to my house. Now I've got a little bit of shame and this kind of stuff, right? When I was younger, I felt much better about myself. Now I'm older and I got things happening and, and so on, and I don't know, I feel good. And so the mind's going to say, get a facelift. And I don't mind if you get a facelift, by the way. I, I'm not talking against anything. I just want you to understand the process. Get a nicer house. Get a nicer car. Get a new girlfriend or boyfriend. Get more money. In other words, do something outside that used to make you feel better or, or you think is going to make you feel better. I want to travel around the world. That may feel better. I don't care what it is. I saw a movie once. The mind only knows what it has already experienced. You know much more. The consciousness is its intuitive understanding of truth is way beyond anything the mind will ever understand. But the mind is the sum of its learned experiences. That's what it knows. So if something made you happy before and you don't feel good, you want to do it again. And so the mind will push you out into the world. Its answer is always get something, lose something, change something, do something. It is always out here. Change the situation out here. Get rid of it or get it. And that will make you feel better inside because that's what the mind understands. It understands that things come in through the senses and they hit your psyche and the psyche either feels good or bad. Doesn't it? Right? And so you are out there chasing in a sense, chasing yourself. Whatever made the mind feel bad, make it go away. Whatever that made it feel good, get it. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why they say that the world is a reflection of, of your inner self. It isn't. I don't want to say that. It isn't. The world is what it is. It's, it's, it's atoms behaving according to the laws of physics and chemistry and psychology. Right? It's science. That's what's out there, science. The weather is what it is. It didn't rain because it was your birthday. Why is it raining on my birthday? It didn't rain because it was your birthday. Why is it raining on my day off? It doesn't rain on your day off. It doesn't know it's your day off. It doesn't care it's your day off. You're doing that. You're projecting your problems out into the world and saying, oh, it fixed it. Look, the sun came out. God must love me. <laughs> Maybe, but okay. <laughs> Don't do that. The world is the unfolding of cause and effect. What is happening right at this moment is the result of everything that happened before, isn't it? Why are you here? Well, so I met somebody and this happened and that happened. Why were you a little bit late? Well, the coffee machine broke and I don't do good without coffee. Everything is the result of every single thing that ever happened. That's what the outside world is. Every moment is the 
perfect representation of every moment that came before it. It's cause and effect. Here, psychology says your mind is the sum of your learned experiences. Guess what the world is? The sum of its learned experiences. And they have nothing to do with you. You weren't even here a moment ago. But this moment it was, and it is a result of everything that ever was. And so now you're stepping into this moment, and your mind is saying, I'm not okay, I need this, and I want that. This will make me happy if you do this. You don't sit next to her. No, she's not next to her. I like her. <laughs> and you're projecting your stuff out into the world, and you're saying, I need to change the world to be okay. And that's the final fall from the garden. Now, now you hit your head on solid rock, and you're out there working to be okay, are you not? Working is a nice word. Suffering, grabbing, manipulate. I like that word, manipulating. That's the word I like. You are manipulating people, places, things, situations, everything to try to get them the way that when they come in, you'll feel better. All right? What does it say in the Bible when you fell from the garden? Now you must work by the sweat of your brow to be okay. Know anything about that? And guess what this world teaches you to do? Work harder. Work harder and wiser. Go out and get what you need. No one has ever won that way, ever the most powerful people, the rich. Come on, we got some really rich people making a mess, don't we? <laughs> All right? And, and it's like, come on, come on. I call that compensation. What you're trying to do is compensate for the fact that you're not okay. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Let's just take that one and we'll go deep because it answers everyone. I'm lonely, okay? What your mind will tell you to do is go out and find somebody. Why? Because you've had experiences, or at least you saw movies, where people found somebody <laughs> and they weren't lonely anymore. <laughs> okay? And that's how you solve it. No, that is, you're not getting rid of loneliness. What do you mean? How do you know? Because if that person leaves you, you're lonely again. And maybe you're even more lonely because you felt what it was like to not have to feel lonely. But you're still lonely. You just put something on top of it. The loneliness is what made you go get this thing. You took it and put it on top of the loneliness. As long as you have this thing, you won't feel as lonely. But the moment the thing does anything that you don't like, you feel lonely. Or you feel you got the wrong thing. I'm not supposed to feel lonely when I come home. I used to get excited. I need to find a new one of you. <laughs> have you ever said this relationship is not working anymore? What does that mean? It's not working. What is it supposed to do? It was supposed to compensate for the fact that I'm not okay. It's not doing it anymore. I didn't feel love. It was supposed to make me feel love. I felt insecure. I'm not supposed to feel not insecurity anymore. I didn't feel supported, and I felt supported. Now I don't feel supported. I don't feel the love. I don't feel, you know, the specialness and so on. It's not working anymore. That's what you mean. It's not working anymore. You're a mess inside, and you expect that person to fix your mess. It's your mess. Why? I just told you. You're the highest being to walk the face of the earth. You're so filled with love, you can't even see straight. All the time. You want to feel love? Wave your hand across your heart. It'll come pouring out of your heart. That's how hard it is to feel love. It's like air. It's always there. It's your natural state. Okay, so now you understand what's happening. You're out there. What do they say? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Okay, you're looking for it out there. Where do you feel love? Out there or inside? Then why are you looking for it out there? This is spirituality. Now you wake up, right? What does that mean? You take a look and you realize, well, I keep getting messed up outside. It keeps causing suffering. I keep getting hurt. Why do you get hurt? Because I didn't get what I wanted. Why'd you feel good? Because I got what I wanted. So it comes down to, I didn't get what I wanted. And that hurt me. I can't believe you said that to me. <laughs> said what? I can't remember, but I didn't like it. Come on, you're caught in that all the time, every minute. And then you're out there trying to manipulate people, places, and things so you can feel a little bit better. I'm glad I started this conversation when we did. Y feel better? You're in nirvana. There's nothing but absolute joy and love and shakti and spirit pouring inside of you all the time. Well, why don't I feel it? Because you're looking at the knot. Because <laughs> you're staring at something that is not experiencing that. And because even though you are complete joy and love and beauty and God. Well, that's a nice word. All right? You are. You are what in yoga we call sat-chit-ananda. Ever heard that word? 
Say it with me. Satchitananda. Eternal conscious ecstasy. That's the word for you in yoga. And the word for God are the same. The word for the Atman is Satchitananda and the word for Paramatma is Satchitananda. But they're the same thing. It's the same consciousness, all right? And I'm telling you, you are experiencing that right now, right now. Well, why don't I feel it? Because you're staring at something that is not that. You're staring at your dark mind and your problematic heart and the world around you with all its conditions that have to be a certain way for you to be okay and so on. You're staring at that to where you're completely addicted. Like I said, you're staring at the knot. Glad I started there. I could build on that, right? If you stare hard enough, then that's what you think you are, isn't it? There's nothing else going on inside of you. It doesn't matter. You're the light that's shining on something dark saying, I'm dark. No, you're not. You're light. But you're illuminating something that's dark. You are the light illuminating something that's dark. The light of consciousness illuminating the darkness of your thoughts, of your heart, of your conditions, and of what's happening when the world comes in. That's the truth. That's what it is. That's the human condition. The new book, Living Untethered, the subtitle is Beyond the Human Predicament. That's the human predicament. What do you do about it? At some point you wake up and you sit there and say, I will never be okay as long as I'm taking the part in that's not okay and expecting the world to fix it. I need to find out why I'm not okay. That's the difference. The example I always use that I see people get it is you're eating food that's making you sick. You got a terrible stomach ache and you keep a real big stock of Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> Every bathroom's got Pepto-Bismol and kitchen counter. It's all over the place and you use it a lot. Now you're eating food that makes you sick. You're running around. I can't find any Pepto-Bismol. I'm out of Pepto-Bismol. Oh my God, there's got to be some somewhere. Right? You're looking all over your house. You're frantically looking to find the Pepto-Bismol and a friend comes in and sees you running around and says, what's wrong? I, 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 I can't find the Pepto-Bismol. That's what's wrong, is it? Or is what's wrong is that you're sick? Or what's wrong is that you're eating wrong? The Pepto-Bismol is to compensate for the fact that you have a stomach ache. Well, why don't we work with why you have a stomach ache instead of trying to find the Pepto-Bismol? Every single thing you're doing that's causing all this commotion is you're looking for the Pepto-Bismol. I'm not okay. I don't feel loved. My career's not going well. I'm getting old. I don't like what I look like. I used to be good looking and people aren't as attracted to me as much. And when I play the music, they used to clap and they don't clap anymore. All that stuff is Pepto-Bismol. It's an attempt to compensate for the fact that you're not okay inside. What the deep teachings teach you is instead of saying, what do I do about the fact that I'm not okay inside? You ask, why am I not okay inside? And you guys are easy to talk to now because I already told you. I started the conversation by telling you how good inside you are. <laughs> so it's not true that you're not good inside. You're just staring at something that's not. Okay, so what do I do about this? Not how do I compensate for it? It makes me cry. Have you ever said, if I get this, I'll be fine? Were you? For how long? If she loved me, I'll never need another thing the rest of my life. We could live outside in the rain, in the tent. That's all I asked for, all right? This is... It's like you're not okay. You found something that compensates for it temporarily. And hey, have you ever heard of the word divorce? <laughs> no, seriously. You, ever, you heard the word divorce? Okay, I want to ask you a question. What percentage, or I'll get it down to a number, how many people, when they're standing at that altar to get married, have a plan to get divorced? None. None. What happened? Oh, it ceased to compensate. It was compensating perfectly, and it seemed like it was going to compensate perfectly forever. That's why I signed the license that said, for better or worse, for all eternity till death do us part. I love it. We're a very funny species. What happened? It stopped compensating. If you're compensating for everything I need, I ain't getting divorced. Oh, well, let's get remarried. Let's have a new marriage thing. Have another ceremony, a remarriage ceremony. That's wonderful. No, it stopped working and then we started fighting, and then we started complaining, and then it all got ugly. Did it ever happen? Okay, that's why. So a great being wakes up enough to sit there and say, it is not about saying, I'm not okay inside, what do I do about it? It's about saying, why am I not okay inside? Why am I not okay inside? Why am I not okay inside? Now you're working inside instead of outside. You have now stepped on the spiritual path. It is not about attracting to yourself what you want. 
It's about finding out why you have wants, because you don't. You're the greatest being to walk the face of the earth. You're filled with love and joy all the time, but you're staring at something that is broken. And so basically, then what does it mean? And I'll do it real quick. I only have a few minutes left. Why am I not okay inside? Because you're blocked. Why don't I feel the Shakti? Why don't I feel this upward rush? Master said, you and I said, there's a river of joy flowing inside of you. Well, why don't you feel the river of joy? For the same reason that downstream from the Hoover Dam doesn't see the Colorado River anymore. Because there's a dam that blocked it. Is it still there? Is the river still there? Yes. But the dam is blocking it. Is the river trying to flow? You bet. They have people maintaining that dam every second. All it has to do is make a little hole and it starts to break apart. Why, that river wants to keep going, doesn't it? It wants to flow. Christ said, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever will open, I will enter. That's what the Colorado River says. I stand at the dam and push. Give me an opening. I'm coming through. Well, I didn't need to. You're blocked. That's why you don't feel the energy. It's not that you're not the right person. It's not that you're not this. It's not that you're not a career. It's not that. Those are compensation things. It's not that you don't have the peptidismal. It's that you're doing things that make you be sick. Well, how did I get blocked? Thank you. I thought you'd never ask. Why would you block God? Why would you block this ecstasy? Because what happened is throughout your life, different things have happened that didn't feel good. I said, some days it rains. Something hits your arm. Things happen. Does every single thing feel perfectly good all the time? No. But does it last? No. It just, something hits your arm or it hurts for a minute. Somebody says something, it didn't feel good. But you didn't let it go, did you? You kept it. You resented it. You stored it inside of you. Before he talks about suppression and repression, I just call it resistance. Like repression and suppression, we call it psychological problems. Resistance is a spiritual problem. Anything you resist, Hey, Sally, how you doing? Sally's your friend. She doesn't say hello. What's going on here? I don't know. There's 8.5 billion people on the planet Earth. One didn't say hello. Neither did the rest. But you can't handle it. You need to figure out why she didn't say hello. What's happening? She's not your friend anymore. Did somebody tell her something about you? And you suppress it. You hold it. You hold it inside of you. How do I know? Because when you see her next time, you don't feel the same as you felt before that happened. In fact, you don't even want to see her. You'll walk around. You know, I'm not going to see her. Please listen to me. Those are blockages. What's a blockage? You just stored something inside of you that you didn't like. Will, will it come back up? It comes back up all the time. You think about why it's Kelly and I say, listen, and that's just Sally. What about your parents' divorce? What about your divorce? What about this? What about that? What about you didn't get the job you wanted? What about you didn't get the corner office? What about the fact you didn't get the raise and somebody else did? What about every single thing that happens every single second that you can't handle? What do you do with stuff you can't handle? You push it away. That is blocking the flow of the Shakti. How do you know? One, just store another one. See how you feel. See how your dreams are. Have an event happen that's bigger than saying, not saying hello. And see how you feel in the morning. See how you feel in the afternoon. Can it affect you? Can it affect how your body feels? Can it affect how your thoughts go? Can it affect your emotions? If somebody says something that you didn't like? Here, put some food into your mouth that doesn't taste good. What do you do? You spit it out. Somebody says something you don't like? Let it go. If somebody's in a bad mood, and they send something to you that's not nice, that you don't like, if you keep it, you're in trouble and they're in trouble. You just took negativity, stored it inside of you, so it bothers you, and then you're going to talk badly about them to everybody. You can't believe what he said to me. So now you store this stuff inside, you could have let it go. What do you mean? Somebody says something, it doesn't feel good inside. Yeah, lots of things you can do. Do a mantra, neutralize it, breathe, let go. Just sit there and say, ah, oh, into every life some rain must fall. You know, I learned to say. I don't say it anymore because it's very natural to me. But I remember when I learned it. Ever heard of yin-yang? That there's this balance in the universe and there has to be. For every yin is yang, it balances. It orbit, plants stay in orbit. Centrifugal force, gravity, day, night, everything. There's opposites. And I found out that if it's true, that it's yin-yang, that if I always get what I want, if God's always giving me everything I want and so on, it's not going to work. He doesn't get to do that. So what God does is he packages up the downside into this little moment and says, I want to give you everything, but I have to do this, okay? And guess what I say? Bring it on. Bring it on. Let's just get it over with. Go on, bring it on. So that anything that's harmful and hurtful gives me the payment for all the things that's beautiful. I get to have everything. That's a nice way to look at it, isn't it? Okay, let it go. And then you won't 
stored inside of you. Then they won't come back. Then you don't have to make somebody eat their words. <laughs> Who said that? Christ. That's what he meant by turning the other cheek. It's not a physical thing. It was said unto you, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, resist not evil. If someone slaps you on one cheek, give them the other one. Let go. In other words, don't store this stuff. Don't store it in there. He said, do not go to sleep at night while having an argument with your neighbor. Let go. Work it out. Don't store this stuff inside. Wow, isn't that beautiful? So that's what happened. You did store this stuff inside. You know you did big time. And you do it every day of your life. And you did it with big things. And you got all this stuff stored. And there's all kinds of stuff you want to think about. Okay? It's got to go. It's got to go. And as it goes, I said there's two ways you're going to find out that there's Shakti underneath that stuff. One is the more stuff you put down there, the more dark you get, the less energy you have, the more things you're afraid of. All right? And then you're going to find out when you go the other way, the more you let go of, all of a sudden there's this this energy flowing inside. It's just unbelievable. Like if you're in love and you love somebody so much and then they say something or do something you didn't think they would do, hold on, hold on to it. Say how much you love them. Let it go. The love will come right back. You are blocking the flow of your Shakti with this stuff you're storing inside. Let it go. Now we can close. Do you know my teachings? Every day, the driver in front of you, the weather, practice letting go. With the tiniest things, practice letting go. They matter. Just practice letting go. The new book, Living on Tether, goes many techniques. Practice letting go. You can practice the piano. Practice letting go. You'll get better at it. And then bigger things will happen. You let go. And next thing you know, you let go of stuff that's already in there. And next thing you know, you let go of some big stuff. Big stuff hurts, doesn't it? Oh, it comes up. All the stuff. Let it go. Relax. Release. Let it go. And you're going to get filled with Shakti. You see, your, your face will glow. Don't worry about how old you are. You'll be beautiful. Just keep letting go. And what will happen is this energy that's blocked inside of you will cease to be blocked. It will start to merge with the energy that's above. It will raise your consciousness, raise your being, and you'll just get higher. Every single day, when you go to bed at night, you should be a higher person than when you woke up in the morning. Every day, because you let go of the garbage that was coming up. And then people say, how do I know what to let go of? It will let you know. <laughs> Won't it? Well, what happens if something really, really big and it hurts so much? And I, I, can't, I just can't let it go. Just do your best. Just do your best. That's all. That's all can be asked of you. Just do your best. Don't push it back down. Don't push it back down. I beg you. You don't want it in there. Just try to relax. But, but I can't do it. Fine. Just do the best you can. A little peace will come up. It'll come up again. Don't worry. You get another chance. Won't you? Trouble is you don't want to deal with it. You do want to deal with it. That's, okay. That's the moral of this entire talk. You do want to deal with it. I promise you, you want to deal with it. You will never have another problem for the rest of your life. But well, why would I do anything? If I'm filled with love and joy and ecstasy, why do I get out of bed? Why do I go to work? Why do I have children? To express the beauty that you're feeling. That's a whole other reason to get up in the morning. A whole other reason to go to work. A whole other reason to get married. A whole other reason to have children. A whole other reason to do things. Because love wants to express itself. Inspiration wants to create and do. When you're filled with it, filled with love, filled with Shakti, filled with spirit all the time, literally flowing up inside of you every second of your life, just pouring like rivers, pouring inside of you. It wants to express itself. Now you're a giver. The highest life you can live is that every single moment that passes in front of you is better off because it did. Can't get better than that, can you? That's how you get. I don't need anything, so you're giving. And they don't even think you're giving. It's just flowing out. Nothing can stop it. So we went the whole way from who you really are. You're a very great being. Baba used to, at the microphone at this point, he'd say, don't be a beggar. He knew who he was, and you knew you were that. Okay. Thank you for listening. Jagger Dev. <laughs>